Hey, Insta family, it's Dr. T here. We are Wednesday night instead of our usual Q&A on a Tuesday night, but we're Wednesday night tonight because I had a, an extraordinary, fantastic evening last night with a whole bunch of West Australian GPs, and we were actually talking about a new progestogen-only contraceptive that is on the market. I'm not sure if you saw my post today, but I was having a bit, little, little bit of a giggle about the fact that uh, as a fertility doctor, I have been asked to talk about a contraceptive. <laughs> kind of ironic, really. But it was a great night. It does fit within my remit as a reproductive endocrinologist. So it was it was quite good fun, actually. It was just really lovely to be able to get out and socialize with my colleagues without wearing masks. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. Lovely to have you guys on. We are here for a little bit of rapid fire Q&A and it, it is going to be really rapid fire tonight because uh, dinner's on the table and I've got to go and have some dinner with my family. But if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the comments. Remember the guidelines. We need to make sure that we're not doing your whole life story. So make it a short, sharp question. You'll be getting a short, sharp answer and as generic as possible so that the answer can be useful for other people who are on here. Please ask any question because I can promise you that there will be somebody else now or in the future that will really, really benefit from you having asked that question. There's some people I know on here, Rach Perry Pilates, Sarah, Siav, Danielle, uh, who else has jumped on? Sarah, Journey to Gain, Ashlyn, Emma. Oh, lovely to see you guys on, Zoe Harris. Good to see you guys on. Now, I haven't seen any questions pop up as yet, so post away. Um, but I did have a couple of DMs. Somebody DM'd me today about progesterone. That's the topic of the month, I've got to tell you. Um, wanting to know how increasing progesterone will help them ovulate. So I just want to explain that like, progesterone is an important steroid hormone for... I guess, maturing the lining of the womb to then allow either it to shed properly if you're having a menstrual cycle or for implantation of an embryo. But it's the byproduct of ovulation. So when you grow a follicle which has an egg in it and you eventually, eventually ovulate it, that follicle switches from producing predominantly estrogen, which thickens up the lining, uh, to then predominantly progesterone, which matures the lining. So progesterone on a blood test is kind of like a biomarker to tell you that you've ovulated. And there are thresholds of progesterone that we'd like to see, which will signify to us whether or not it's an adequate amount. And there's some lovely work out of Spain by a great dear colleague of mine who I'm on a board with, Dr. Elena Lambata. I love listening to her talk, <laughs> La Bata, um, talking about the importance of progesterone thresholds and us measuring it at, at the time of an embryo transfer. And in fact, some data has suggested that if, if it is seen to be low, the pregnancy rates in that embryo transfer are seen to be lower. If they then supplement in progesterone to raise the levels above a certain threshold, then in fact, the pre pregnancy rates do increase. So um, it is a really important hormone. It's important for implantation. It's important for pregnancy rates. But in the context of can I improve my progesterone to make me ovulate better? It's actually the byproduct of ovulation. So you've got to go back and have a look at why you're not ovulating properly. That's the long and the short of it. Go see a fertility doctor so they can investigate. Right, Life of Brit has asked a question. Can frequently fly FIFO um, affect sperm health quality amount? Oh my goodness, that's such a West Australian question. How many people do I see who do FIFO and they have social infertility because of their jobs? It's a really, really challenging thing that we see here. It's quite unique to WA. Um, can it affect sperm health? Um, well, well we, know, we do know that there is increased radiation exposure when flying. Um, there's a whole bit, heap of work on health in um, air hostesses. Uh, many years ago, looking at the exposure to radiation. And, and it can be quite significant, particularly if you're flying frequently. Um, as far as has that work been done on sperm and, and oxidative stress on sperm? No, not really. Um, there's actually some work that has been done on truck drivers looking at increased oxidative stress because men who sit in trucks for long periods of time sit on their testis. 
Um, and if they're a rather large man, uh, we'll certainly cover up their testis, but that can cause both physical trauma, but also heat trauma as well. So um, I can't clearly answer that question, Life of Brit, but certainly there is some evidence that um, lifestyle in, in that environment can impact on sperm uh, health. And one of our measures that we use, one biomarker we use, is to look at the DNA fragmentation of sperm. And, and um, you know, I, I have seen men in the last week with really high DNA fragmentation and they have either lifestyle, environmental or even health impact factors that uh, either chronically or acutely have increased that oxidative stress. So we try and get it down through change in lifestyle. Does that mean he has to give up his job? Mm, that's something you and he need to discuss. Life of Kate. Ooh, life of Britain, life of Kate. What are your thoughts on Emma Alice tests and their validity? Yeah. So what we're talking about is endometrial receptivity tests. And uh, you might have heard of ERA, endometrial receptivity assay. So that's where we take a sample of the lining in that window of implantation and we send it off for genomic testing to see is there a personalized time when we should be transferring the embryo in that window of implantation, which is about four days. Alice and Emma. So Alice and Emma use the same tissue and they run um, assessments, genomics um, again. And the Alice, so Alice is, if you look at the word Alice, C and E stands for chronic endometritis. So about 40% of bugs you can't culture. So you can't grow them in a culture and go, oh, you're infected with. But you can do their genomics, the genomics of the actual bug itself. Uh, and so that's what the ALICE does. And the EMMA, M-A, stands for microbiome of the endometrium, microbiome. So microbiome is kind of your good flora environment. And there are signatures at different times in our cycles, including in the window of implantation, that are supposed to be favorable or not favorable. Um, and there are certain species of lactobacilli that should populate the endometrium at a certain time. Lactobacilli crispus, I think, is the one that is, or crucii, are the ones that um, are thought to be um, most beneficial for implantation. <clears throat> How we supplement back, well, that's another topic. But um, is Alison, and do I rate them? It's an emerging field of science. We do believe that individualizing uh, transfers and individualizing treatment around um, um, chronic endometritis, around ensuring an optimal microbiome possibly could be important. Where probably the rubber, where the work is most useful, I think, in people that have higher numbers of recurrent implantation failure or recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, probably more implantation failure. So not someone who's had three embryo transfers. I don't think the value is really there. Maybe in someone who's had 11 embryo transfers, like a, a lot of good quality embryos that have been transferred and have not resulted in a pregnancy. I do think that there is probably a role, but watch this space. Um, GGM2P. I'm sure that stands for something. I'm just not smart enough to figure it out. Are women with thin PCOS less likely to respond to lifestyle interventions? Yeah, yeah. Correct. So PCOS is kind of like a spectrum from that typical textbook appearance, sort of centrally overweight, very hirsute, bad acne, metabolic syndrome. So that hyperinsulinemia that probably is related to um, nature and nurture, a bit of genetics, probably a family history of type 2 diabetes, maybe cardiovascular disease. Um, and part of reducing that hyperinsulinemia is changing lifestyles. So utilizing up the sugars through doing more physical exercise and also moderating diet. Um, and that results in weight loss. And we know weight loss is a confounder for and probably a contributor to the, the PCOS syndrome. And often that can be enough to regulate cycles. But if you have optimized that lifestyle, i.e. you can't really lose any more body fat, uh, you're already an exerciser and your diet's pretty good from a, a sugar perspective or a carbohydrate perspective, then there's not much further that you can go in improving that. And if you've still got really resistant, irregular cycles, then um, you've probably got really resistant disease. 
Um, so probably less likely, less, not impossible, but less likely to respond to lifestyle. So having a good look, you know, do you do adequate amounts of physical activity being thin? Um, and, uh, have you optimized the carbohydrate intake? I would definitely engage a fertility dietitian who understands, um, what things are going to drive your insulin and what you need to put into your diet and take out. And, and if you think you've optimized that and you still got these irregular cycles, then you, yes, you probably got um, quite resistant, quite, quite a resistant syndrome. All right. A couple more minutes, guys. Ashlyn McKenna, when would you use something like Louvris versus not in a protocol? So Louvris to everybody out there is recombinant LH. It is another one of the hormones that the pituitary produces and is largely responsible for flaring and causing ovulation. But in the context of including it in in a stimulation cycle, actually recombinant LH will increase the number of FSH receptors. So it makes your response um, a little bit more potent to the recombinant FSH, like, you know, Gonalef, Recovel, um, Menopil, those kind of drugs. When would I use it? If your own endogenous LH is really low. Uh, So I'm always looking at the LH on day two of your cycle to see whether it should be included. And I'm watching to see if it drops. One thing that we know really drops it is probably stress. So we we can see it really plummet in highly anxious women going through IVF. Um, And so you can replace it with recombinant LH like Louvre. So you can, or you can replace it with a click of Ovidril, or you can replace it with a Minipure that it has it built in. So, uh, but certainly it's to try and improve follicular development in someone who doesn't, not producing it, producing their own endogenous LH. Um, all right, couple, two more. I'm going to go two more questions, guys. Margaret, pros and cons of leaving cervix in when having a hysterectomy. There's no pro. <laughs> it's no, we, I mean, why are you having a hysterectomy in the first place? If it's to control bleeding, I can tell you if you leave the cervix, you're probably still going to have bleeding issues. It also means that you're going to have to continue having pap, through, pap smears through until you're 70. You're still at risk of getting cervical cancer. Um, a lot of people used to think that you keep it in place to preserve sexual function. Um, randomized control trials have told us it doesn't actually uh, help in any way. So I don't see the point in keeping it. And you can have keyhole surgery with a, with a com- total hysterectomy where you take the cervix and four little incisions on your tummy, but with a subtotal where you leave the cervix, big cut on your tummy to get the rest of the rest of the stuff out. So um, I, I can't really see the benefit, and most gynecologists would counsel you against uh, against leaving it. Last question, Emma Green. Do you have any comment re conceive? Mm. Now remind me, I'm having a brain fart. What's conceive? <laughs> multivitamin maybe sounds good good marketing good name i'm not sure what it is sorry you're gonna have to remind me i probably do know i'm just having a difficult one remembering so i'm gonna answer another question r mckinney how can i confirm pcos i was confirmed then months later said i wasn't but had an ectopic pregnancy all those two things are not related okay ectopic pregnancy and pcos mind you a woman with pcos does have a higher incidence of ectopic pregnancy but that's another that's another chat so pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome it's a syndrome what that means is it's a cluster of symptoms um, we most commonly use the cri- the rotterdam criteria um, to define what is pcos so three things you have polycystic ovarian morphology on an ultrasound, big bulky ovaries with lots of eggs. It's a kind of a blessing. You have very irregular, oh, sorry, wrong figure. (laughs) You have very irregular periods. What that means is not a period that's like 35 days, one month, and then 28 days the next. No, no, no. I'm talking like 45 plus days apart, two months apart, that kind of irregularity. Um, You have either clinical, obvious, or biochemical on a blood test, evidence of high levels of male hormones. So clinical evidence would be bad acne, bacne, um, and hirsutism, for example. So, you know, male hair growth here, here, on your nipples, down your tummy, on your inner thighs, down your lower back. Um, so either one of those. Now, you have to have two out of three of those things in order to be classified as PCOS. And you have to rule out all the other causes like hypothyroidism or congenital adrenal hyperplasia or a big tumor on your ovaries. 
So that's how you define if you've got PCOS or not. If you're unsure, if your doctor is unsure, please go and see a reproductive endocrinologist so that you can get the right diagnosis and management. Did we clarify what conceive was? Girls out there, anywhere else, fill me in. What's conceive? I'm going to have to go look this up, you know. Uh, just lastly, Ashley McKenna has asked about uh, the usefulness of sperm fragmentation tests. When you come to see me, I think it's pretty useful. I certainly use it to help on counselling men's health. And as I said, sperm is a great barometer for a bloke's health. So if he's got a really high DNA fragmentation, there's something going on. Um, and it's worth going and looking for his general health and well-being, but also for conception. Um, but remembering, of course, I'm seeing a skewed population. I'm seeing people who are struggling to conceive, so they're trying to find a reason why. So I do think it's a valuable test to count, do and counsel on. Guys, I'm going to have to wrap it up. I'm going to get in so much trouble if I am not sitting at the dinner table. I am so excited because I sat with my social media gal, Shani, from Forge Marketing today, and I just want to give you a heads up that November is going to be Fertility Nutrition Month. I know you guys love this stuff. <laughs> I know you love it. So I'm going to be connecting with our amazing fertility nutritionist from Womb, Nick Nation. We're going to be doing a little Q&A together. Um, and I'm also going to be connecting with the dietologist. You might know all about Steph. She's an amazing fertility dietitian who works in Sydney. So that's so we're just brainstorming about what that's going to look like. But you know what? If you've got questions in that arena, make sure you save them because you know these guys are the experts that are going to help you out with those answers. Have a beautiful rest of your week. I'm off to Melbourne. My goodness, I feel like a jet setter. Sydney last weekend. I'm off to Melbourne this weekend for the CREI exam preparation. And um, yeah. I will see you on the flip side. Have a great rest of your week. Fabulous questions. Thanks for sharing. Oh, I will go and have a look about Conceive and I will come back to you during Fertility Nutrition Month. See you soon.